Someone asked me to look into a topic called mechanical gravity. I had a quick look into this and it sure seems to be rather interesting. In a nutshell, mechanical gravity refers to a set of ideas that were being developed in the time between Newton and Einstein. Famously, Isaac Newton derived his law of universal gravitation based on observations of the moons around Jupiter to which he applied his laws of motion. Now, Newton talked about how he did not know what the mechanism for gravity is, and this is why his framework is called Newton's law of gravitation and not Newton's theory of gravitation. Of course, after Newton presented his conclusions, there was a scramble to find a mechanism behind the law. No one ever really came to an agreement, and the subject provides a great who's who of famous scientists throughout history being very wrong about things. So let's explore these ideas a bit further because this gives an opportunity to shit on some of the greatest minds in history rather than just flat earthers, woo peddlers and climate change deniers. I think the best place to start is actually before Newton with the concept of ether vortices as proposed by René Descartes in his book The World which he wrote between 1629 and 1633 but not published until much later because of a fear that the church would consider it heresy and his buddy Galileo already got into a tight spot with the church at this point. The treatise is an interesting one as it does speculate on the idea that everything is made of small particles and heat is actually just the motion of these particles. But he also speculates that everything is made of three elements, fire, air and earth. Whatever happened to water, I don't know. Descartes also described the three laws of Cartesian motion and the first law states that each particular part of matter always continues in the same state unless collision with others forces it to change state. The second law states that when one body pushes against another, it cannot give the second body any motion unless the first loses as much of its own motion at the same time. Finally, the third law states that when a body is moving, each of its parts individually tend to always continue moving along a straight line. Now this is cool because you can see that Descartes was exploring these conservation laws that are the foundation of Newton's laws, but Descartes was also insistent that the whole universe was filled with ether particles because a vacuum can't exist. The idea then is that if one particle moves the empty space it leaves behind will instantly be filled by another particle, but of course that other particle leaves an empty space which is then also filled by a third particle. He reasoned that this causes ether vortices which are responsible for the orbits of the planets. He saw this kind of like a fast flowing river going around a bend. If you drop a feather or some leaves in the river then these would go around a bend quite easily but a heavier object like a boat would be deflected a bit but most likely hit the bank on the far side of the bend as the force of the water is not sufficient to get the boat to change direction sufficiently to go round. In this analogy, Descartes sees the water particles as the ether particles swirling around and the planets as the heavy objects. This of course implies that objects with more mass must have larger orbital radii and today we know that this is somewhat problematic. Now Huygens later developed this idea further such that it had an exact mathematical form. However, it did not follow the inverse square law and Newton had already demonstrated at this time that the inverse square law is definitely a thing. Huygens agreed that this was a failure in his model and attempted to update it, but unfortunately he ended up presupposing the universal law of gravitation, so from a mathematical and philosophical standpoint, it was useless. Another issue is that the ether vortex idea would lead to only circular orbits and we know that planets' orbits are not circular. Even though we now know that the mass distribution doesn't work for the orbits in the solar system, at the time they couldn't know, the right bodies hadn't been discovered yet. But back then the big killer for this idea was that you could plainly see that there were objects which opposed the direction of the ether vortex and thus violating the laws of motion. Neither Descartes version or Huygens version were ever regarded as viable theories. But next is the concept of ether streams and Newton himself entertained a notion of ether streams and that normal matter was carried by the ether streams like in Descartes or Huygens framework and it was carried towards massive objects. Newton took quite an interest in this idea but he ended up settling for, oh, fuck it, I don't know, it's probably magic. <laughs> 
Now, Bernard Riemann picked this idea up again in 1853, where he assumed that the gravitational ether is an incompressible fluid and normal matter is an ether sink where the ether is destroyed or absorbed. This causes a flow of ether towards matter and everything else just rides that flow. However, this leads to a problem. If the ether is some medium like water that makes stuff move, it must have some energy so that it can transfer that energy to the object to make it move. So if the ether is destroyed or absorbed, where does that energy go? Riemann speculated a workaround by suggesting that the ether zaps off into another dimension or universe, but of course this creates more problems than the theory solves. Okay, at this point, I can anticipate the electric universe not as whining about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and call hypocrisy as it uses multiple universes to explain stuff as well. Now, my response is simple. The many worlds interpretation is just speculation. It's not a theory. Now, Ivan Yakovsky proposed that the ether might be converted into new matter rather than being absorbed or destroyed. But again, that still creates more problems than it solves, because this suggests that all objects will increase in mass over time. The idea of ether streams was then also never accepted as a viable theory. Going back in time to 1671, Robert Hooke proposed that all bodies actually pulsate in the ether and that this causes ether waves. He argued that massive objects move towards the source of the wave. Now, about 200 years later, James Chalice picked this idea up and he actually formulated a mathematical framework for this, which appeared to work, but it brought an interesting prediction. If the wavelength of the wave created by one object is large compared to the size of the other object, then there would be an attractive force. If the second object is larger than the wavelength, the bodies repel. And Chalice claimed that this could actually explain all forces. The question then becomes how large the wavelengths need to be. Now, two galaxies will be attracted to each other, so you could say that the wavelength needs to be larger than a galaxy, but then the wavelength is larger than pretty much anything, and it's always attractive. But then you could say that this is extreme, and you only need to consider the constituent parts, and then you can take that down to a subatomic level even, and this is where it gets interesting again. Take a positron and an electron they would be attracted towards each other. Both are infinitely small particles, so you can't have a wavelength shorter than the width of an electron or a positron. So far, this holds. But then you swap the positron with an electron and they repel, which is odd considering that this requires a wavelength shorter than the width of a particle, which is infinitely small. Which leads to the question, how can you have a wavelength shorter than zero? Of course, you can get around this by considering the electron's wave function, but then there still is the issue as to why the wavelength of the first electron's ether field would change depending on whether the other particle is an electron or a positron. Chalice was not privy to the knowledge of electrons and positrons, but the objections at the time were actually already simple enough and far simpler than those issues I've described. If matter creates these waves, then matter must always be imparting energy into the ether. Where does this energy come from? James Clark Maxwell pointed this out, and in fairness, James Chalice was very quick to admit that he hadn't really thought this one through. Now, there are many more ideas that people have entertained throughout history, but it is time to move on to the king of the mechanical explanations for gravity. Lesage's theory of gravitation is also known as screening, and it was first developed by Nicolas Facio de Douillet in 1690 and developed further by Georges-Louis Lesage in 1748. Even though this is the king of mechanical gravity concepts, this was never fully accepted as a viable theory. At first, this was due to the explanations not really offering anything testable, but other problems popped up over time. The idea behind screening is that all of space is filled with particles or ultra-mundane corpuscules which have some momentum and these particles travel in random directions like particles in a gas and when these particles hit proper matter some are absorbed or deflected depending on what version you're reading about. In any case this corresponds to some momentum being transferred to the proper mass. So we take object A, which is being bombarded with particles from all direction, but then 
we introduce object B. Object B blocks some of the particles coming in from the direction of where object B is. And this means that one side of object A isn't being bombarded with these particles. So the pressure isn't uniform over the surface of A, and there is a net force acting in the direction of object B. You can take the reverse being the case for object B, and object B is accelerated towards object A. So here we have mass appearing to attract mass. But we have to consider the inverse square law as well. The body that is blocking the particles from a certain direction will subtend some solid angle, and particles coming in from this angle will be blocked by the object. The solid angle that the object subtends is given by the object's cross-sectional surface area A divided by the distance squared. So this satisfies the inverse square law. Where this all goes wrong is when you consider the conservation of energy. If you think of the body being in an equilibrium state and the body is bombarded with these particles from all directions, and we take the mechanism to be that the bodies absorb these particles, then the body would heat up as their energy is absorbed. If we take the mechanism to be that the particles bounce off the body and transfer some momentum, then we run into trouble. If all collisions are perfectly elastic, then you can imagine that there exists a particle C which would have struck object A, but is blocked by object B. But it is equally likely that there is a particle D which would not have struck object A, and now would strike object B, and be deflected to strike object A. As a result, nothing would happen, so we have to conclude that the collisions between the particles and proper matter are inelastic, and this means that some energy must be lost in the form of heat, and considering the magnitude of the forces we are dealing with, a lot of heat. Lesage's theory is interesting. When you go from the start, it seems pretty sensible, and it appears to work. It describes how mass appears to attract mass, and it can even describe how the force is proportional to mass. As the cherry on top, it also obeys the inverse square law. But you also have to evaluate the ideas in the context of the time, and there wasn't really any notion of thermodynamics, and there wasn't really much of a formal definition of energy. And it all seemed to work, but even at the time, the idea of screening was still treated as highly speculative by virtue of it not really being testable. As our understanding of physics developed, the idea fluctuated in its acceptance. The development of thermodynamics then pretty much killed it. But at the end of the 19th century, it started to get revisited by people like Hendrik Lorentz and J.J. Thomson. But they didn't get very far. In 1905, George Darwin considered the idea for a bit, but again, he didn't really get anywhere. And this is understandable, because 1905 was a very important year for physics. This was the year where some 26-year-old German guy came out of left field and published some papers. The first paper was on the photoelectric effect, which solidified quantum mechanics as the way forward. The second paper was about Brownian motion, and it settled any controversy at the time over statistical mechanics and showed that atoms were more than just convenient mathematical objects. The third paper described special relativity, and the fourth described the mass-energy equivalence. Now, if you accept the conclusions that these papers drew, then you also had to reject Lesage's theory, as Henri Poincar showed with some calculations in 1908. The problem was drag. Now, drag had already been identified as a problem in Lesage's theory, but Poincar really demonstrated how big the problem was. According to the idea of screening, there are more particles coming in towards the Earth on the nighttime side as they do on the daytime side, as the daytime particles are blocked by the Sun. And this creates a force directed towards the Sun. But the Earth's tangential velocity prevents it from falling into the Sun, because after all, orbiting is nothing more than throwing yourself at the ground and missing. But there are also particles coming in from the side, and the Earth must be bumping into these particles, especially in the direction of the Earth's motion. If an object moves at a speed v in one direction in a medium where the particles have an average velocity of vg, then the rate at which it encounters particles on its leading face is increased by vg plus v over vg. On its trailing face, it is decreased by Vg minus V over Vg. So the drag force is given by the difference of these multiplied by some reference value for force. 
This should tell you something interesting. The velocity of the particles is in the denominator and there is some reference value of force due to the particles in the numerator. And there is an issue. The Earth is in orbit and to maintain its tangential velocity, drag must be negligible. Otherwise, the Earth would just crash into the Sun very quickly. And this means that either the force due to the particles is small or the velocity of the particles is really big. And that force represents the momentum transferred from the particles to the mass to account for gravity. So this cannot be negligible. And as a result, Vg must be really big. Poincar calculated that the lowest limit for the velocity of the particles must be at least 10 to the 15 times the speed of light, or 10 to the 17 times if we are being a bit more conservative. This is why, if you accept Einstein's conclusions in the 1905 papers, you cannot accept Lesage's theory. Of course, special relativity didn't really have an experimental backing at this point, and people still carried on trying to make Lesage's theory work, but thermodynamics still kills the theory. The energy that must be absorbed by the Earth from these particles would be around 10 to the 21 times the power output of the Sun, again as calculated by Poincaré. In the meantime, Einstein threw everything out, and being liberated from the notion of an ether, he started playing with different ideas to come up with general relativity. As the overwhelming evidence supporting both special and general relativity came in, Lesage's theory was slowly abandoned. Now, I think the whole topic is very interesting, although I can't really do it justice without a whole team of science historians digging through the records. After all, my videos are really nothing more than me talking shit with some PowerPoint animations, but I thought that I would cover it as different mechanical gravity frameworks are largely ignored in your standard science outreach content. Normally, you will get a narrative which is along the lines of Newton figured out a thing and no one knew what the mechanism was. Nothing really happened until about 230 years later when Einstein came along with general relativity. Since then, we've been happy bunnies. And this is simply untrue, and it doesn't really set the scene correctly for the theory of general relativity, because even GR is often painted as coming out of nowhere, as if the only reason why Einstein looked into gravity was because he was bored. But when you introduce Lesage's theory of gravitation, it all makes more sense historically. The dominant narrative is that people just accepted Newton's framework and the lack of a mechanism and moved on with their lives, and somehow it was only Einstein who had the audacity to question it. But when we consider these mechanical explanations for gravity, we see that general relativity came out of a long line of people trying to figure out the mechanism for gravity. Einstein's Annus Mirabilis papers killed the notion of these particles causing the effect of mass attracting mass, and it killed the notion of the luminiferous ether. Without these papers, we could very well still be chasing the same ideas along the lines of screening, ether flows, or vortices. And it is the tearing down of those mainstream ideas that paved the way for such a brilliant and elegant description of the universe as provided by general relativity. The description is so good that even though we know that it is incomplete, despite 100 years of throwing everything we have at it with billions of pounds of investment, we still haven't managed to disprove it. Of course, there is a large coordinated effort to develop new theories of gravity, and funnily enough, Lesage's theory was revisited by Nobel disease sufferer Tom van Flanden in the 90s. His conclusion was that gravity propagates at 20 billion times the speed of light. Of course, we know that one to be incorrect now. We have directly observed neutron star collisions and measured the resultant gravitational waves at the same time. And this shows that gravity propagates at the same speed as light. Finally, I will quickly mention that there is, of course, an effort to develop a particle theory of gravity with quantum mechanical descriptions. None of these bear any resemblance to any of the ideas that we have discussed here. So, Wu Peddler, shut up. So with that, I would like to thank my patrons who know who they are and how awesome they are, and of course my newest patron, Dino Ridgeway, who also gave me the idea to look into this. I have also started a coffee or ko-fi or Kofefe page, however the fuck you want to pronounce it, and this will be for those who wish to impart one-off donations. However, I have received messages from people who want to make larger one-off donations, and although possible on this platform, I will publicly repeat the reply I've given to those people in private. 
please consider local community resilience initiatives first. And I would like to emphasize the word local. These are hard times for many people and it may not get much better for many anytime soon. Focus on your community first. Any donations I receive are greatly appreciated, but they are just a bonus for me. My basics are covered without them. Your neighbor's basics may not be. Thank you all for watching and until next time.